Hello and welcome to episode 325 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back. How are we doing? I'm good, Andy, but I know I can't say, well, you can't say the same. Um, people listening might have just noticed that Andy's got, he's feeling, I think, a bit rough at the moment. He's he's, he's not got COVID. He's had the tests. He's just got, yep. we think, what have you got, Andy? <laughs> it's my seasonal cold, isn't it? I get it every June or July, a bit of a chest and a bit of the hay fever thing. But we have had the PCR test and we would, we did everything correctly as per the protocol. So all is good. Yeah, all is good. But it just means that Andy's going to have that that sort of deep voice today. So I'm going to do yeah. probably even more of the talking. Well, you did a kind of growl there, Andy, when you said, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Barry White. <laughs> uh, I, my, my wife has found me strangely more attractive over the past few days. So maybe that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. So apart from Andy, everything's good on, on my end. And well, I don't want to immediately date the podcast, but it's always been uh, good fun to have the... We we even have the football on in the office, so we do like to put the football on for the Euros and stuff like that. So it's been good fun having that in the background as well. And we're also going through a big content update. So you'll have seen loads of content being pumped out by us. So before we carry on the podcast, I do want to ask you to send in your reviews because that will make Andy feel better. And we will read them out in the future because we're not going to read out any this week because Andy, I don't think, could cope with that. Um, (laughs) Andy, I'm going to tell you what's on the podcast. Please do. I'm going to do three pieces, okay? So the first one is an investment piece I'm going to do. And I'm going to go in a bit of a geek mode with this one. And those of you who who know my past know that I I have a mathematical background. I I did a degree in mathematics. I do love mathematics. And it's a piece that is bringing that together with the world of investing and something called Fibonacci numbers, which I'll explain more about. The second piece is regarding a a scam, a money scam that 50% of people, a piece of research has stated this, 50% of people had never heard of and wouldn't know how to identify. And it's a scam that's growing in prevalence that everybody needs to keep an eye out for. So I want to talk about that. And the third piece we're going to do today is a piece on board games that are good for teaching your kids about money. And the best bit about this piece this week is that we've got Bronte, our newest member of the Money to the Masses team, coming onto the show. Great. So shall we start with the numbers piece where you can show off your mathematical skills? Well, it's Fibonacci, okay? And to save your voice, Andy, I won't ask you if you know what Fibonacci numbers are, but there was a there was a chap by the name of Leonardo of Pisa who would later be known as Fibonacci, who back in 1202 wrote about a series of numbers called Fibonacci numbers. Now, while this string of numbers I'm going to talk about called Fibonacci numbers was obviously made famous by this Italian mathematician, there are traces of this going back as far as 200 BC in Indian mathematics, which is quite interesting. So what are Fibonacci numbers? Fibonacci numbers are a series of numbers whereby the two preceding numbers, when edges together, result in the next number. So for example, it starts typically with one and one. I've seen versions where it's zero and one, but if you think of it, the first two numbers in the series are one and one. So one and one added together equals two. So that means the next number is two. Then the two preceding numbers added together, which is one and two, add those together, you get three. Then you add two and three together, you get five. Add three and five together, you get eight. And so I want people now to sit down with a piece of paper on their phone and see if they can work out the next series of Fibonacci numbers. Now, we could give them a countdown clock like um, on the TV program, but that would probably get in trouble for copyright. But instead, I will just read out the series of numbers so you can see how they go. So the numbers are 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, and so on and so on. So you get the next number by adding the two preceding numbers together. Very simple. That's what's the beauty of the Fibonacci series. It's very simple. Anybody could come up with the numbers to infinity. You could just keep going. Now, why are these numbers interesting? It's not just the fact that each subsequent number is the sum of the two preceding ones, but it's also something if you look at two numbers in the series that are next to each other and you divide one by the former, then there's something called a golden ratio starts to occur. So if you divide three by two, so three follows two in the series, then you start to get head towards, as you move up the series of numbers, a ratio of 1.61803. And that's called a golden ratio. So it's like a a magical number in mathematics. 
Now, Fibonacci numbers can be found in nature. That's what makes it so fascinating. And so if you think of the petals on the flower, they often follow Fibonacci numbers. So, for example, lilies have three petals. You can find flowers with five, eight, 13. So for example, daisies, apparently, or a lot of daisies have 13 petals. And so this is a phenomenon that you see in all over the place. The spirals on a pineapple is another example. Uh, storms, so hurricanes, follow a Fibonacci sequence. And how that works visually is if you look at something like a, a storm from above it will have a, a spiral shape now the explanation of how you get to that is a little bit complex but if you start to build blocks together this is how you can find youtube videos which will link to one for you so you can see how it works but if you start to put building blocks together in a Fibonacci sequence, what you find is it starts to grow bigger very quickly and you can actually build a spiral pattern using it. Galaxies uh, along the same line, are probably a better visual one is tree branches. So if you imagine a tree trunk growing up, that's the first number in the sequence, so that might be one, then it will divide and you might get the next level up, you might get, for example, two branches. If you imagine lots of trees when they grow, when the branch divides one of the subsequent branches only one of them then subsequently divides again so if you go up a tree if you follow that pattern so you go from the tree trunk you go up and the next level up you've got two branches and the next level up you'll have three branches and the next level up you'll have five branches in the tree of course it doesn't work exactly like that but that way of growing means that the subsequent branches higher up you get some very big numbers but they do tend to follow this Fibonacci sequence so you see it everywhere and that's what makes it fascinating. And so people look at this thing, and why, why would it appear in lots of places? And I suppose um, one example could be that if you think about a petal when you've got petals on a flower, there's always going to be a, another space in between a petal where another one could potentially grow. And it's kind of that idea of where what was there before influences what comes later. It starts to see why you can get Fibonacci numbers occur in nature. So it's fascinating. And then people are thinking, well, what is it about these numbers? They're not actually anything that's formulated from a mathematical proof. They are just a series of numbers that then start to have these properties. And this is where that golden ratio number comes in. So you get these other numbers that you can get off of it. Now, the reason why that golden ratio that I talked about is interesting. And if you remember, that comes from if you start to divide two subsequent numbers by each other. So you divide a number by the one preceding it, you get a number called a golden ratio. The further along that Fibonacci sequence you go, the closer and closer you get to this perfect ratio number, which is 1.61803. It goes on for a long time, a bit like the number pi. That ratio has relevance in investing. So investment markets, if you think of a share price, again, we're going to link on the post for this particular show. Every show we do, there is a uh, there is an article on the Money to the Masses website where we link to resources and we try and link to them in the show notes. Obviously, sometimes we are limited by what Apple allows us to do. If you find the post, we'll link through to different bits and pieces relating to this section of the podcast. But if you think of a share price, or let's go even bigger, let's go the S&P 500, so the American stock market. And you know that line's going up and down as people go and buy the index, then the share prices go up or they buy the shares within it, the share, that index goes up and it can come down. So you've got that rise and fall. Now, what is interesting is that if you look at those wiggly lines, they seem random. But you can draw lines of support and resistance in there. And I think we did this on a podcast previously. We certainly talked about candlesticks in the previous podcast. That was episode 275, if you want to listen to that. But if you imagine a wiggly line going up and down that represents, say, the S&P 500, then there'll be points where you will notice that the market will come back. Let's say it corrects and it starts to fall. And then it will turn around and start to head up again as more buyers enter the market. And then you'll notice that happened at the same level as what it had done previously that's a support line or you might find as the market gets towards a certain number could be say 4200 on the S&P 500 that the market tends to turn around and start to fall away again it struggles to get through that and it's called a line of resistance those exist on stock markets and you can find them by just simply drawing lines get a ruler get a chart and you can join up Typically, it works best if you've got at least three points that you can put along the ruler that join up and then you can draw a line and you can see that, yeah, the market seems to bounce off of this level or it, whenever it hits this level, it then starts to fall. 
That's the resistance line. If it bounces from the line, that's called support. Now, those lines aren't set in stone forever. They change as the market moves up and down. They're quite difficult to pin down. What happens in markets is Fibonacci enters the fray and you do get Fibonacci retracements, they're called. So you get something called Fibonacci retracements and Fibonacci extensions. And I'm going to briefly run through what they are and how it works. Just so people can understand that this magic number, the magic of maths, if you're somebody who's young at school listening to this podcast, then you can realize that those things that you learn about do have an application in the real world. So the Fibonacci numbers, which we've already know what they are, if you look at the podcast notes as well, we'll list them in there. We have this ratio, we talked about the golden ratio, But you can also get something called Fibonacci ratios, which works slightly differently. So what you do in this instance is if you start to divide numbers that are next to each other, but you do it slightly the other way around. So you actually divide a number by the one that comes next. So you get a a percentage. So what that would typically be 61.8%. That's number. If you decided to get a number and you divided it by one that came two positions later in the sequence, then you would get a number that's equal to roughly about 38.2%. Then if you did it with the number, you got a number and you divided it by a number in the Fibonacci sequence that was three spaces to the right, then you'd get 23.6%. So these ratios are consistent all the way through the sequence, or they become more and more consistent. So again, it's another almost magical property of this sequence of numbers. Where this becomes interesting is if you take those ratios, and we'll show you a diagram, you don't have to understand them fully, is that they can predict or seemingly predict where markets might start to turn, sell off, or where they might rebound. So those lines of support and resistance, rather than you having to get a ruler out and trying to judge where they are, Fibonacci comes to the rescue and can show likely places where those support and resistance lines will be, or in other words, where the potential turning points of markets are, which if you are trading, which is what people use these Fibonacci retracement methods for, is to try and work out when to get in the market and when to get out of it. And they work in uptrends and downtrends. It's really about the underlying trend that's going on with markets. You're trying to work out, is the market going to turn? Or is the market, if it has turned, is it about to pick back up again and continue in the same direction as the overall underlying trend. Now, for the rest of this bit of podcast, I'm going to assume we're talking about an uptrend, not a downtrend. So somebody might decide to use Fibonacci ratios to help them decide when to get back into a market that's had a a retracement, a pullback. So let's imagine that S&P 500, it's been going up like a rocket. But then we start to see it pull back a little bit. We start to see the market fall. And that means there's some sellers entered the market. People maybe are taking a bit of profit. Then at what point could we expect to see it turn around and then start to continue higher again? Now, Fibonacci retracements, it's a tool you will find on a lot of trading platforms. And actually, if you go to barchart.com, you can do this for free. So if I will put a link in the show notes and you can go and see a chart of the S&P 500 and you can then ask it to put Fibonacci retracement levels on a chart. And so to give you an idea of how it works, like I said, let's imagine that the market was rallying and then we get it turns around and it falls a little bit. What you do is you use the tool and it takes the rally upwards. So we'll call that the pop. So it pops higher. So there's a definite movement higher by the market. Then we get the retracement. And what it does, it then at the low of that level where you think the market could potentially turn around or where it has, you can then use those ratios between the size of the pop and the retracement to try and see where the market's going to go next. And it's quite an interesting method because it can be spookily accurate. Now, why would that work? Why would fundamentally random lines seemingly being drawn on the chart showing you where the market could potentially pull back to or continue higher to. So where's there a price target where you think the market could ultimately get as far as in the future before it turns around? Why should that work off of Fibonacci numbers? And the answer is no one really knows. And it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy, I think, because If you have enough people looking for these patterns, and like I say, they occur in nature. So why wouldn't they occur in what effectively is a map of human behavior, which is what stock markets really are, buying and selling, then why wouldn't we see 
Fibonacci ratios occurring in equity markets too. And as I say, I think it's down to a lot of people looking for these levels based on the Fibonacci method of trading that causes it to be really adhered to more often than not. And you see levels where the market has respected a level that the Fibonacci numbers have effectively predicted would be a support or a resistance line. So I won't go into detail into how you create them because you don't really need to know how to create them. It's just there are two methods. One, which is a Fibonacci retracement, which will show you if the market is in an uptrend, but then it starts to turn south. For example, I'm focused on uptrends in this part of the podcast. As I said, if it starts to turn around, you can then try and predict how far the market is going to fall before you should get back in again before it turns around and starts heading higher, which is called Fibonacci extensions, which is a similar method using ratios based upon the market moves preceding it, a bit like Fibonacci numbers, where things are based on what's come before, to be able to dictate the size of the subsequent move and how far it could go, and therefore when you might want to get out. So it's something that I want people to have a look at. Enjoy the idea that it's based around mathematics. We don't really know quite why it works, but now you understand when people talk about Fibonacci levels. They'll look at the retracement levels. Fibonacci retracement you'll see mentioned a hell of a lot. That is simply the application of a mathematical sequence to trading that does seem to have some success. Some people swear by it. Others think it's just a load of nonsense. And the reality is, I think a lot of the time, the Fibonacci retracements, when you're looking about how far the market is going to change like a counter trend. So I'm talking about uptrend that's going to pull back that slight counter trend, how far that will go before we resume the uptrend. That seems to be where a lot of people use it and it seems to be fairly effective. But one thing, like a lot of indicators that you may use if you're trading or just generally investing, is that it probably works better when you use it in conjunction with other indicators or other styles of technical analysis. So other support lines that you may have drawn. If you find a Fibonacci line coincides with one that you've drawn because it's at an all-time high, for example, that might give it extra evidence that that could be a key level to keep an eye on. If there's a, a rising trend line or falling trend line, something like that, that could be on your chart that the Fibonacci retracement levels or extensions seem to respect as well, that could be a sign of an area where the market will potentially turn around or do something different so it's the wonder of mathematics hits the investment market world is why i'm quite enthused about this piece do go and have a read about it don't necessarily have to use it to get into trading it can be for somebody who's a long-term investor just as something to think that how far could the markets go i get a lot of people who wonder whether markets are going to turn out and roll over it's just another piece of potential information that can help people make an informed decision if they are into trying to second guess where markets are about to go. And interestingly, Andy, before I move on, you can use it rather than looking at price. So how far a share price might go up or down or an index might go up and down. You can use it for time periods as well. I won't go into it, but how long it will take before the market turns around or does something, which is quite a novel and interesting approach, which I've not really seen too much of but I've seen obviously reference to it but then this leads on to something else that I could cover in a, a podcast at an equally high level like I've done now I don't go into the detail but an equally high level so people understand is Elliott wave analysis which is something else which is much more to do with market cycles which there is an element of Fibonacci in that as well so there you go mathematics colliding with investment markets that people sometimes can make money from sometimes lose money Okay, so moving on to scams next. And this has been highlighted in a recent bit of research where 50% of the people who are asked about this potential scam, one, they haven't heard of it, but they also wouldn't know how to identify it if they're presented with it. So what is it we're talking about here? So this came from a piece of research, which I have to credit the company who did it. Um, I think it's a company called KIS Finance. That's not a plug for them. Don't go and look at their website or anything like that. This is just an interesting piece of research, which the aim is that they want you to do that but don't bother the, the, you the, just completely the, undermined that bit of a uh, bit of uh, well i just i don't want pe- <laughs> anyone could do a piece of research i don't i don't know anything about the company but it's just an interesting point they've raised and the reason i want to talk about it is because if 50 percent of people don't know about something that means half our audience doesn't and then that worries me now there's something called a safe account scam and well it's 48.3 percent which is 
almost a half of people don't know what that is. And I have to say, it's like when I talk to my, my, even my youngest, who is five, or my older daughter, both at primary schools, when they come home and they talk to me about the sort of split infinitives or diagraphs and things like that, and, and I'm just thinking, what? What's, what's, what's one of those? And I feel like I have to go back and learn what these things are. But the fact is, we've been using them all the time. We just don't know what the name is. So the idea that no one's ever heard of a safe account scam doesn't surprise me because a label of a, a, a first scam is a bit like I say, uh, my daughter talking about, is it a diagraph, Andy, I'm talking about? Is it is the way when you're reading words, you start to learn about the sounds, a diagraph or something like that? Your 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 wife would know very well because she's a teacher. Sounds about right to me, yeah. I'm sure uh, if it isn't right, we'll have lots of comments and that's fine. You can get in touch if we've got it wrong. In fact, put it on the Facebook group, why don't you? We can have a chat about it. All of those words that we hear about of our children at school and we have no idea what they are, but pretend we do know. <laughs> Yeah, but but the fundamental point is we can read despite not knowing what they are. Now, a safe account scam is typically where you get a call from a number that could be your looks like your bank, for example, and there'll be somebody on the other end who will tell you that your money has been compromised, your savings have been compromised potentially by a scammer. And you ne- therefore need to transfer the money to another account that they've created in your name for you. That supposedly is your bank. I'm doing the inverted commas thing that doesn't really work on podcasts, but I am. And they appear to be from your bank or they may claim they're from the police. And the phone number that will ring you often, not always, but often will appear to be from your bank as well. That's called spoofing. So people can make their phone numbers or text messages appear to be from your bank, even though they're not. And then what happens, a person is obviously not wanting to lose their life savings, will then move the money across to the account that they think the bank is telling them to do. It's already been set up. And in fact, the person on the phone is a fraudster, is a scammer. They're asking you to move money to another account that they can control and as soon as you do that the money will be gone and you've unfortunately lost your savings and the thing is what often happens as well is in early parts of the conversations you may have the fraudsters or scammers may ask personal information that you may give to them which they will then subsequently use if they make communications with you to verify their identity and your identity and you've forgotten that you've actually given them probably your date of birth or whatever the piece of information is. They're very shrewd operators, of course they are, and they know what people do. And if you somebody rang most people up and said that their life savings were at risk, they would probably panic if they thought it was their bank. Now, as I say, 50% of people never heard of this type of scam or wouldn't know how to identify it. Hopefully you're more likely to know I've told you how they typically work. But worryingly, 25.7% of people would transfer all of their money to a safe account if they believed the police or their bank had called them to do so. So that's one in four people would actually move their money across. Now, it varies by age, which is quite interesting. If you actually drill down, it isn't a case that it's just a young person thing, people being naive. If you look at it, then 18 to 24 year olds were about one in three would have never heard of the scam and a similar number would transfer their money across. When you get all the way up the age groups, then it largely is about 28 to 30 odd percent that haven't heard of it. Seemingly the 25 to 34 year olds seem to be the most clued up with only 18 percent saying they never heard of it and the over 65s also claim they've heard of it perhaps they've been better educated by some of the things that they read but when it comes to transferring money definitely the younger you are the more likely you are to move money across with the over 65s only 8.6 percent likely to move money and that's probably because they are naturally more cautious you'd hope but when it gets to the younger generations actually 25 to 34 year olds almost one in two of those would transfer money so the message on this part of the podcast be aware of anything like this and don't move your money across now some tips that your bank will never call you to do this they won't call you up out the blue and ask you to move money across if someone does it's not your bank the other thing that you should do is you're ever worried about someone that rings you up call your bank back okay but don't use the number that they've given you use the number on the back of your card that you've got so now your debit card because that's going to be a number for the bank the other thing is that to be doubly sure is go and use a different phone and the reason i say that is because sometimes you can get people on a landline for example can remain on the other end of the phone you think you've rung them pick the phone up start dialing away and actually they're still there sitting there quietly and then pretend to answer so do use another phone like your mobile for example and the other thing is trust your gut you've got a gut a natural instinct for danger that's been evolved 
over millions of years to keep us humans out of danger. And I do think people don't give enough credit that if something doesn't feel quite right, that's why it's there. Yeah, it was there to stop you getting eaten by dinosaurs, but equally in the modern era, it can be a safety net for you actually not paying your money over to people. So do trust your gut as well. So that is a safe account scam. Hopefully we've just improved the number of people who've heard of it, but hopefully we've reduced the number of victims because according to Santander, if you go back to 2019, then there was a 53% rise in the number of cases of this type of scam with the average person losing just over five and a half thousand pounds that's interesting stuff and i'm sort of smiling as i as i say this bit because as you were just finishing that piece which is a a very insightful and useful piece and hopefully listeners have learned a lot from that but the piece about trusting your gut and that we've done that for years in fact we (laughs) we use that to make sure we didn't get eaten by dinosaurs david i hate to sort of be the one to to give it to you here but i'm pretty sure dinosaurs and humans have, have never coexisted i'm just putting it out there. are you telling me jurassic park isn't real <laughs> i think i am <laughs> yeah well even even if humans didn't coexist with dinosaurs fibonacci numbers did so that brings us to our third piece on the podcast this week and i'm pleased to welcome bronte to the show our newest recruit of the uh, money to the masses towers welcome to the show bronte hi thanks for having me so we've been wanting to get bronte on the show so if you've been following the website you'll see that bronte's been writing lots of stuff particularly about crypto yeah that's my area now cryptocurrency yeah, yeah and bronte knows lots about crypto tell you what Bronte has actually taught me quite a bit about Bitcoin and crypto. So it's been exciting to have Bronte on the the team. She's very good at what she does. We only recruit the best. So what (laughs) we've got this week, Bronte has come on because there was uh, some interesting stuff about, was it the Scouts? Yeah, it was uh, the Cubs and the Beavers in Enfield in North London. So they've started this new scheme. They're trialing this new badge that basically the whole point is to teach kids about money, particularly with a focus on money in the online world to sort of like in-app and online transactions, because that's sort of where everything money related is heading. Um, But it's just to introduce kids to the idea of money because quite often school curriculums don't cover it that much. So it's just to get them learning about it from a young age so that they're more prepared for it as they go into sort of adolescence and adulthood. Do you know what? I was a beaver. I, I was I was a beaver. <laughs> yeah, I didn't I didn't progress to... No, did I go into the scouts? I don't think I did go into the scouts. There, there's some pictures somewhere. I've got to find them and share them on I think on I might media. have been a brownie. I, I don't know what... <laughs> I, I, brownie sounds... I don't... I just remember the sort of the after school club at my, at my primary school being called the brownies. And I don't know if that's actually like... An independent group. Or they, they were just, called the Browns. Or they just stolen the name. Maybe. <laughs> So we've done some pieces on previous podcast episodes about teaching children about money. So if you go back to episode 266, we did a piece and episode 230. But what we're going to do today is Bronte's picked out a couple of board games, actually, that will help children learn about money. So Bronte, what's your first one? I'm guessing Monopoly's on the list. Yeah. So, well, first of all, all of these are like readily available from those of retailers and they're super affordable and accessible and they're all under £20. So they're all great but one of the main ones that I picked out was Monopoly Junior so this is basically aimed at ages five to eight and it's for two to four players and this one has 4.8 stars out of five on Amazon so this is one of the highest rated children's board games on Amazon so the aim is pretty much like the original you buy up as much of the board as possible um, so that you can charge rent to people as they go around the board but it's kind of simplified to make it more kid friendly so yeah fast and fun version of the original and also they've changed it so you don't buy like streets it's actually more accessible it's like pet stores like candy store video game arcades so it's just a little bit more more suited to kids it's less about property and more about things they might be sort of interested can, in can i just ask did you ever like monopoly as a kid because i hated it i never got to the end of the game <laughs> well we- actually that's exactly what this is about because the whole idea is that you can play monopoly junior within half an hour so it's designed to be really quick because we've all had that experience of sitting with monopoly for like four hours where you're just like i want dinner now i'm not yeah, interested and, and being anymore pummeled, <laughs> and being pummeled into submission by the person who's bought park lane and yeah, mayfair yeah, yeah. and that yeah. sort of stuff so i quite like the idea <laughs> yeah. that there are other versions i've seen one that i can't remember the name of it now but it's a monopoly version that's based on brands and it's just basically very quick it only takes about 10 minutes and you buy the brand names so things like xbox or whatever and you're building this one tower it's 
it's basically a race to buy a cup about 10 brand names so you it doesn't last very long so monopoly junior that's yeah. one what's about the next one um so another one is called buy it right so this one's for ages five to ten and it's for two to four players that's kind of standard for most board games um and this one has 4.6 out of five stars on amazon so still really high and the aim of this game is you basically move around this board buying goods and filling up your sort of little trolley and you have to sort of add and subtract the prices of things as you go through so this is really good for like practicing mental arithmetic with children and there's also three different skill levels so for example if your child is younger you might want to start with the the easiest skill level so that the mathematical problems are just relatively simple but there's three skill levels in total so that can be adjusted to your kids developmental stage someone on amazon this was quite interesting said that their daughter had this calculia which is uh, the mathematical version of dyslexia so basically it can be quite difficult to sort of comprehend mathematics and they said that that game was particularly good at getting their child with dyscalculia to understand the concept of money. So that one's obviously very accessible. And yeah, so that one's got very high ratings. And then the final one is called Money Bag. So this one's for a little bit of an older group. It's six to 10 years, two to four players again. Um, and this one also has 4.6 stars out of five on Amazon. And the aim of this one is to earn pocket money by going around a board and landing on a square and each square has a task on it such as for example setting the table and that would be worth 20p but then in order to collect the money that you would earn from completing that task you spin this spinner and the spinner will tell you which coins you can or cannot collect from the bank so for example it might say the task is worth 20p but you're not allowed to use 20p coins to collect it from the bank so the kid would have to for example maybe get two 10p coins or four 5p coins or something and it encourages that mental arithmetic but also an understanding of the different tiers of how money adds up and things like that and it's just really good practice for sort of understanding and getting used to the idea of money changing hands and that quick mental arithmetic you might need when you're in the store and you're at the till i love that though yeah. i love that bronte because i think one of the issues we, we talk about on the podcast before is that people don't see or children don't see adults using money mm. i very rarely use money i tend to use a card so i love the idea that there's a game that's teaching them to not only recognize coins but how to use them and change yeah so that all of these games actually have very realistic coins and notes i mean one of them i think it might be buy it right the coins and the the notes look exactly like real legal tender and they do have a note on them <laughs> scrolled across the front saying this is not real <laughs> because it's actually that realistic and that's really good for getting kids used to the idea especially because we're using cash less and less now particularly after covid when everything was sort of debit card only for a while it's really good to get them used to using cash because it's something like you said that they don't necessarily see very much because kids are predisposed and they they particularly like uh, learning in a tactile and physical way so i think pandering to that by explaining the concept of money using that physical aspect is really helpful i tell you what i want to throw in one that you you've just made me uh, reminded me of as I listened to your description of that last game is one that we played at home was called pop to the shops and it's my kids loved it and the game the simple premise of the game is up to four players but it's for su suitable for children as young as five and my daughter played it when she was like four or younger i think it was because what they do is you just on a very simple board you've got a set of things you've got to buy on your shopping list and you've got to go to different shops to get it and use the correct change but it's a very simple game but it's quite easy to play and actually as an adult it's not a bad game because one of the issues you do have with some games is that they're good for kids but they're a little bit tedious for us adults when we play them so before we wrap up on this piece because i think they have some brilliant suggestions from bronte Andy, I know you've been waiting in the wings because there's a game that you like. Yeah, that's right. Um, we've been playing a, a fun game for the family and it's to do with money as well. It's called Big Money and it's for two to five players and we've played it lots and lots, especially over the lockdown actually. And it's become the go-to game primarily because it's one of those games similar to what Bronte mentioned earlier where it can be done and dusted in 30 minutes. Now there's something about a game as a parent where you can guarantee an end within 30 30 minutes is quite appealing so um, this is for ages eight and up but actually our daughter is seven and she understands it perfectly well so i would say it's probably really for ages six and up would probably benefit from it and it's effectively a cross between yahtzee and monopoly so it's a similar monopoly theme where you get a chance to buy assets and hold on to them and charge people rent but there is an element of risk versus reward do you buy the assets do you hold 
on to the money that you earn from rolling your dice, which is the Yahtzee element. And um, once the bank has run out at the end, you count up your money. Assets are no longer worth anything at the end. It's all about the money. So it's quite an interesting concept for the children to understand about actually spending money. And that's one of the problems I have with my eldest daughter. She's a brilliant saver, but she really struggles to spend money. And we noticed in this game, she is definitely one of the ones that holds onto the money, doesn't buy the assets and hopes to have enough money at the end. So interesting concept. It's about £18 on Amazon. It's rated 4.6. It's a pretty popular. So that would be my recommendation. Brilliant. I like that piece because I've got a confession. I'm a real, oh, well, I've become a massive board game kind of geek because of lockdown. So I mean, I've, I've got some obscure games from like other parts of the world and that weren't even released in the UK or America and had them imported across as we play them with my kids. Not about money, about all sorts of things. So I love a board game. So at some point, I, I keep saying to the office, the people in the office, so you guys, that we won't have to bring one or two games into play. We won't, if we do, it won't be about money. I promise you that much, Bronte. So <laughs> Bronte, thanks for coming on the show. You were fantastic Thank as you. ever. Yeah, so we're going to bring Bronte on more because we've been introducing more and more of the people at Money to the Masses Towers. So Bronte will be back on the show in the not too distant future. So that wraps it up for this week, Andy. So if you want to get in touch with Damien, you can do so. It's Damien at moneytothemasses.com. Twitter, it's at moneytothemasses with the number two. Don't forget we're on Facebook as well. Facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash moneytothemasses. And if you can review the podcast in the meantime, before we come back next week, there's every chance we'll be reading your review out and that could well be mug worthy and a mug could be winging its way to you. Damien, I think that's it. We're done for this week. I'm going to go and get some lens up, I think. Yeah, good. And I hope you feel better for next week. So until Until next time. Until next time.